157. To God be the glory, great things he hath done. So loved he the world that he gave us his son, who yielded his life and atonement for sin, and opened the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory, great things he hath done. Oh, perfect redemption, the purchase of blood to every believer, the promise of God, the vilest offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus a pardon receives. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory, great things he hath done. Great things he hath taught us, great things he hath done, and great our rejoicing through Jesus the Son, but purer and higher and greater will be our wonder, our transport, when Jesus we see. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory, great things he hath done. On Hurricane Isaac night, what a blessing. And uh, the track of the storm is going more westerly. Amen. And uh, so we say amen there. But up in the panhandle, they're saying, oh, me, oh, me. And, uh, you know, it's bad to pray that way. But we are having the Republican National Convention this week. So we have some other things to worry about. But we're uh, just thankful the Lord's been good to us. Praise the Lord that we look like we'll be spared. But a lot of folks tonight were a little bit nervous about getting out, I'm sure, uh, considering the rains may start. And I don't know why they would think that way. They, they might, you know, you'd have to preach a long time for it to flood. I don't know why they didn't have that idea that, that there would be a long-winded, I don't understand that. But anyway, uh, great service this morning. Tina joined the church this morning. We thank the Lord for that. And uh, the altars were full. You know, one thing I've noticed, and some of you that have been around uh, our church for a while, I've noticed that uh, the altars now uh, are being used so much more. Uh, when I first came three years ago, we were just uh, uh, not near. You say, well, preacher, you must have a lot of sinners. Well, the truth is, yes, we do. But, you know, people that are striving want to get things right with God. And I praise the Lord. A good altar call this morning, lots of good decisions. Let me give you a quick update. Brother Hurst is not uh, having a good day. He is in a tremendous amount of pain. And I was talking to Rich, who reported that uh, his pain level is very high. Brother Rick said he's been up there and talked to him. Uh, they're still diagnosing and trying to figure out. So please pray for Richard. And then I think Anna is also under the weather as well as what I was told. So uh, pray for that family. Your mom a little bit sick too, Melissa. She's, so both uh, hers, but Rick especially. And uh, last night, uh, Brother uh, uh, was it uh, Keith said that he, he was watching him, and I was watching him during a meeting, and he was just sweating and cold, and uh, he was already uh, heading that way. So whatever's going on with Rick, you pray for him and uh, pray for delivery, and also pray uh, for uh, several of other, our, our church family. Uh, if you did not know the Conti son, Jack, and some real 
uh, touch and go things there with him. So pray for the Conti family and the other requests. But it's good to have the Earnhardt family tonight. And uh, boy, this is uh, one of our favorite missionary families. And uh, they, they are not here by choice, as it were. They've had a lot of health issues. And uh, so they've taken a medical furlough. We're going to have John come in just a little bit and uh, kind of catch us up to date uh, on everything. Some of you can relate to that. You know what it is to go to the hospital back to back and different things. And uh, so hopefully that'll be an encouragement to us. And uh, looking forward to a good time. First time or first time in a long time. Do you have anybody visiting tonight? I see mostly returning folks. Uh, thank Lord for a great crowd this morning. We had a lady that was back again today. And uh, she was here last week. And then uh, several, several visiting families. Uh, neat, neat guests this morning. I don't know if you met a uh, gentleman set over here with Mr. LaRue or not. But he is the inspector general over at Tampa Patrick, uh, not Patrick, uh, McDill, McDill Air Force Base. And uh, he has promised to be here for Honor Our Hero Sunday. And he asked if, if he wanted us, if we wanted him to wear his uniform. And I said, well, yeah, absolutely, you know. And uh, he is the inspector general over there. And he's getting ready to retire after 26 years uh, in the Air Force. And uh, he's looking at a, at a career in Chick-fil-A after his retirement. So he was here with his wife, Jennifer. And uh, they said, we love this church. What a blessing. So a uh, good amount of visitors today. And we praise the Lord for that. Uh, let's pray together. And then I want you to go around and find someone you don't recognize. Recognize uh, east meet west, west meet east, north meet south, south meet north, and go find some folks, say hello. But uh, let's remember now we've got two weeks, uh, just uh, September 9th, on our heroes. Let's bathe this thing in prayer and uh, let's invite people. We've got a big week of ministry ahead, FBI tomorrow night, and a lot going on. So let's pray for a great week this week of ministry. And, uh, you know, let's pray for these people in the panhandle. It, it's uh, uh, when you go through hurricanes, you know what it's like to get ready to go through another one. So let's pray for these folks. I'd like to ask uh, just uh, if we could, uh, I'd like Ryan, if you'd lift your voice there in the back and ask for to bless the service tonight. And then I want you to go find somebody that you don't recognize. Shake their hand. Brother Ryan. And find somebody you don't know, shake their hand. As we make our way back to our seats, let's sing with, along with this chorus, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Very good. Take your hymnal, if you would. We'll turn to hymn number 457. Hymn number 457. 
Oh, no, I'm sorry. Hymn number 389. 389. Blessed be the name of the Lord. It's 538. What am I looking at? We're going to do 538. Blessed assurance. Jesus is mine. Hymn number 538. Yeah, here. One more time. <laughs> 538. Here we go. All praise to him who reigns above in majesty supreme, who gave his son for man to die that he might man redeem. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Let's pause right there for one moment. We had a little technical difficulty there. Blessed be the name of the Lord, hymn number 538, and we have it now on the screen. Is that right? Very good. Let's start on the second verse. His name above, very good. Ready? Here we go. His name above all names shall stand, exalted more and more. At God the Father's own right hand, where angel hosts adore. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Redeemer, Savior, friend of man, once ruined by the fall. Thou hast devised salvation's plan, for thou hast died for all. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. His name shall be the Counselor, the mighty Prince of Peace. Of all earth's kingdoms conqueror, whose name shall cease. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Very good. Let's continue with the great singing as we turn to hymn number 389. My, uh, there we go. Now here's what I want to do. How many of you know how to read music? If you know how to read the music, would you take the hymnal? There is a chorus. This chorus, when we get down to it, has two parts. If you know that second part, would you sing out on it? And then everybody, if you don't know that second part, then you'll just sing along as it, as it normally goes. Ready? Hymn number 389. I will sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me. How he left his home in glory for the cross of Calvary. Yes, I'll sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me. Sing it with the saints in glory gathered by the crystal sea. I was lost, but Jesus found me, found the sheep that went astray. Through his loving arms around me, drew me back into his I was bruised, but Jesus healed me. Faint was I from many a fall. Sight was gone and fears possessed me, but he freed me from them all. 
Yes, I'll sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me. Sing it with the saints in glory gathered by the crystal sea. Days of darkness still come o'er me, sorrow's paths I often tread. But the Savior still is with me, by his hand I'm safely led. Yes, I'll sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me. Sing it with the saints of glory, gathered by the crystal sea. He will keep me till the river rolls its waters at my feet. Then he'll bear me safely over where the loved ones I shall meet. Yes, I'll sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me. Sing it with the saints in glory gathered by the crystal sea. Wondrous story of Christ who died for us. You may be seated. Don't ever, don't ever, don't ever uh, get tired of telling uh, that story to those who know it best, but also who are hungering and thirsting to hear it like the rest. We have a job to tell the nations, and uh, we are developing, and of course we're always developing. We want to keep growing uh, our missions program here at Community, and uh, we want to keep adding God's choice servants that have felt the call to leave their comfort zones and to go somewhere else and start churches, uh, win people to Christ, baptize and train nationals to go start other churches. And uh, for years now, we've had the privilege to partner with the Earnhardts, and uh, we, we really, uh, there's, there's, we love our missionary families, and then there's just some that you connect with, and uh, this connection goes way back to when Valerie was a, a young lady, and uh, Miss Becky went on a mission trip to Haiti uh, when she was herself a young lady, and so uh, they remember each other from years and years and years ago uh, uh, there, huh? What I was trying to point out that Becky is a seasoned veteran missionary and my wife is but a baby, amen. No. Um, a few years ago, Becky was in high school and Valerie was in not high school. And so anyway, that was a good introduction up until that moment right there. But uh, John and them had to come home because of uh, health problems. And, and John, you just come, and, and we love you here. We thank the Lord for you and your family. And you feel at home. Just kind of catch us up with what's going on and why you had to come in and, and then how things are going and, of course, what's going on back home. Right, Good to brother. see you, buddy. So what does he say about the missionaries he doesn't like? That's what I want to know. The last time we were here, we were invited to sing special music, and um, I remember, uh, well, pastor didn't ask us to sing tonight, and, and well, in the car, we were talking about why that might be, and we remembered that uh, the last time we sang, Abby's was the only microphone that was working, and I think she was singing Elto, so when all you hear is Elto and nothing else, it doesn't sound very good, but like anyway, no, uh, our... Our pianist is not with us. Andrew is, is up in Pensacola, and it sounds like he's going to get hammered with some, uh, some fun rain uh, or whatever. I'm not sure what to expect. But anyway, um, we do appreciate your prayers and uh, appreciate so much your friendship and the ministry. It's been a blessing to get to know Pastor Stansel and uh, some good fellowship that we had until who knows what time. I think they kicked us out of the restaurant the last time we were here, but we enjoyed learning all the connections that we had and how the Lord brought our paths together and, and the work that God's doing here. It's exciting to be at church where folks are excited about being in church Amen. and where the pastor is excited about being here. And you don't have to go the uh, contemporary route and all the other stuff that people are doing to try to get people excited about God's word. Um, one of the things we've noticed in, in coming back is that things are changing and they're changing uh, very, very fast. And um, uh, I, I think... The conclusion that we've come to, just in my wife and I talking about it, is we, we don't need new stuff. Uh, we just need to go back into the old stuff the right way, and God will bless it. He'll, he'll continue to bless it, and so I just trust you to be faithful. Uh, if you've been out church hunting at all or you have been, you've traveled at all, you know that uh, uh, you're very, very blessed, and I hope you don't take that for granted. 
And we just went through a very difficult time, uh, first time it ever happened to us in a ministry where we had a pastor and his family had a moral failure, and uh, just this last February, and it was uh, probably one of the most trying times we've had in our ministry. And um, one of the things that came out of that, which really opened my eyes, and, and I just want to share with you as well as a church family, uh, God raised up a group of men. We've been praying for years that the men would step up and be responsible and take leadership in the church. And uh, I did not have to confront our pastor or his family. I didn't have to do anything. They stood up and said, uh, in, in the meeting, this is what God's word says. And according to God's word, we're, we're, with tears in their eyes, you, they said, you're, no, you're not qualified to be our pastor. And we want to help you and want to be a blessing and, and everything. And one of the things that they said, and they noticed a number of things, of course, when, when you have a failure in one area, there are other areas where you're also failing. But they said this, they said, the direction of our church is not just up to the pastor, it's up to us as men and leaders and families in the church. And the direction of your church doesn't just depend upon this man that's here. It depends on you doing your Bible studying and your uh, homework and, uh, and, your own, and your own studying in your home and, and, and keeping faith personal. I just trust that you'll be as faithful to God's word as you expect the man of God to be faithful to his word. And I think that's, that's what we understand, that the work of the church needs to be done by the church. And I'm not scolding you tonight, I'm just saying that's a lesson that, that I've learned. And I think that's a reason why so many churches are going so quickly from one extreme completely to another extreme because the people sitting in the pews either don't care or they don't know or, or they just need to, uh, to get connected. So I, I pray that it won't just be a uh, pastor and his good plan, but it'll be God's people uh, following God's plan for their church. Um, anyway, I'm not preaching tonight, but I had to get that in. Uh, praise the Lord, our works in Peru are doing very well. I had a pastor ask me about a month ago, he said, this is a question I like to ask pastors, what does your exit strategy look like? And it took me by surprise a little bit, and, he, and I said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, if, if you had to pull out of Peru, what does your exit strategy look like? And, um, and I guess, well, my job is to work myself out of a job. Right. And praise the Lord, all of our churches that we're working in have national pastors. Uh, the last church we were in where the pastor uh, had to step out, we have a man who's filling the pulpit right now, could potentially be the pastor. We're not sure. The church hasn't made a decision about that. But, um, but the churches are going forward. Uh, I'm not sending any money to any of the churches. They're uh, providing their own, taking care of their own needs, uh, taking care of their pastors and their salaries and everything, and we praise the Lord for that. It's a blessing to see God's people taking care of their pastor. On a personal note, um, last fall, my wife had to come back with Abigail after a trip to, uh, after, in Peru, we took a trip to a high altitude area, uh, area called Puno, if you know anything about that. It's one of the highest altitude lakes uh, in the world and went over about 40, 14,000 feet, spent about 10 days, 8, 10 days uh, at around 13,000 feet. And that altitude uh, hit, hit all of us if you ever had altitude sickness. But Abby already was sick with a virus and her defenses were low and then she got altitude sickness. And they believe at that time she either got a bacteria or a parasite, and we're not sure. But it attacked her nervous system, her tech, her attacked her digestive system. And since then she's struggled with two or three migraines a week. And so Becky came home in October and uh, was in Rochester, Minnesota at the Mayo Clinic. They tried all kinds of stuff, had her on very heavy medication, but never found what was going on. Uh, that medication had a lot of really bad side effects. She began to bleed out of basically every cavity in her body. And so in January, Becky came back to Jacksonville uh, to the Mayo Clinic uh, just to get maybe another set of eyes to give us a second opinion. And they, they said, well, I'm sorry, at this Mayo Clinic in, in Jacksonville, we, we don't see minors. Uh, and your daughter's under 18, and so you'll have to go to the children's hospital. So she was referred to Wolfson's, I believe, in the Moore's clinic there. And they were shocked that they gave her so much medicine. Uh, but of course, one doctor's not gonna say to another doctor, you shouldn't have done that, and so we still, we're still stuck with the bill. I was hoping it would kind of go away, you know? Right. But we're still praying toward that end. Uh, but anyway, they, uh, she was there for another month in January, and uh, I did, they did identify the damage that was done, but they don't know why it was, it was done. So uh, anyway, uh, she didn't improve at all uh, over the last few months. Uh, Becky came home in the end of January, and so after counseling with our sending pastor and our mission board, they recommended that we come home for a, a three-month medical furlough, uh, which ends around the middle of September. We still don't know what's going on, but Abby has improved a good, a good bit. She's gotten a lot more strength, still has trouble sleeping at night, and her digestive system does not work without 
they're having to take stool softeners and things, so we're still not sure why that's going on. But uh, anyway, just pray for her. Uh, her energy level is good. She feels like she can go to college. That's been her desires and goals, and so she's enrolled at Pensacola. And after Isaac goes along its way, I'm not sure what the brother meant over there if it goes east or west. Somebody's still going to get hit by all that <laughs> rain, but I understand. Uh, I'm not sure when we'll get to Pensacola, but Lord willing, soon. And uh, just praying about all the different things, and then uh, we will still be here for a few weeks to see uh, how she does uh, and settling in. It's not just, it's kind of a double thing, not just the health issues, but it's also very difficult for missionaries coming off a field to adjust, readjust to a culture, not really sure where they belong. Our oldest daughter, Sarah, uh, struggled a lot, is still struggling. Please pray for her. Uh, just feels disconnected. And I don't know if anybody outside of a family that's been a missionary family or maybe a military family would understand what that means. Uh, and then our oldest son, Andrew, is uh, praying about uh, what he's going to do for a second year of college, possibly enrolling at Pensacola. We think that's what would be best, but we want what God's best for his life. And uh, uh, so just be praying about that. Uh, I got thrown into the medical thing. I ended up with a, a hernia that I got somewhere uh, along the line the last year or two. And so I got that repaired two weeks ago, and I'm feeling great. Uh, I can't carry anything, so I guess the boys will have to carry all my suitcases. That's just too bad. <laughs> But uh, it's kind of fun. Hey, pick that up, put that up there. You know, hey, put, uh, carry this over there. And the problem is I can't carry uh, our three-year-old daughter, so that's not very much fun. But anyway, uh, but God's good. And then Justin got on the surgery list. He didn't want to miss out. Um, and we, we've always known something was strange with Justin. Um, he's 14, and that in itself says enough. But not only that, uh, but we noticed a lot when he was growing up, especially little, learning to walk, he'd trip and fall a lot. We thought, you know, he's a boy, you know, how those things go. Their brains take longer to develop. And, uh, but but uh, the doctor said, no, actually, he, he has kind of pigeon toes, walks on the inside of his, of his feet. But over time, he'll, he'll grow out of that. It shouldn't be a problem. Uh, but he hasn't. And so after a CT scan this, uh, two weeks ago, um, they confirmed that he does have uh, an issue with his hips, and they're out of alignment, and some bones are not did not grow properly, and so they need to, uh, I don't know, do some hammering and nailing and whatever. But they're going to reset his hips uh, and put some pins in, and so they have to do one leg, basically like a, a hip operation, uh, uh, replacing a hip where they do one, and then when that's recovered after four to six weeks, they'll do the second one. And it would be best for him to do it all at once while he's still young and can recover quickly. So we're we, they, they have us on the list. We're just waiting for a phone call for us to, for them to tell us, hey, here's the date, surgery date. So we're praying about that, that they'll push it up just as soon as possible. And uh, tentatively, we'd go back to Peru, and maybe Becky would come back and uh, when he needs a second one done. We're not sure. So uh, it's not fun being in the air. Uh, we don't have a schedule. We don't have a routine. Everybody's going crazy, but uh, especially being locked in with the rain and whatnot. But uh, pray for our family. It's... Um, uh, when you're used to being very busy, you're used to having a, a weekly schedule, you have school, you have ministry, you have something every night, uh, you feel like a fish out of water. And so uh, uh, just pray. It can become frustrating. It can become depressing. And, uh, and we just want to stay focused and do what God wants us to do. So we threw a lot of things out at you. If you just pick up a couple of those things and pray for us, we would really, really appreciate it. Thanks for your prayers and your support. We're proud to be your missionaries. Thanks, Pastor. Wow, that's a lot. That's a, that's a lot for just, uh, if it was just uh, the daughter thing or maybe John, but you throw all three, four in. Uh, at the end of our service tonight, uh, let's make sure that we take a love offering uh, to be a blessing to the earned hearts. Uh, our church, uh, summertime, and especially August, is always a tight month financially. I remember years ago, uh, Dr. Harold B. Seitler talking about uh, when you need to, to get funds for your own church, the best way to do that is to give money away and uh, to support more missionaries and be a blessing. And so uh, as we're praying about closing out August and our own funds, let's do something for Brother Earnhardt and his family. Uh, could you imagine just one of those sicknesses or not uh, all three, but then you're out of your country, uh, your kids are going to college, so you're doing the whole separation thing. Uh, there's a lot on that plate. So let's receive a love offering, Brother Steve. We'll make sure at the end of the service and uh, try to be a blessing. We can't fix... Um, 
the medical stuff, and we can't do anything else, but we could help them with expenses and that kind of stuff. So something we can do. And maybe you're not prepared to give, but if you would like to give in the weeks to come, uh, anything that you give in the weeks to come, mark it Earnhardt and uh, make sure Dan, he'll get it, and we'll go ahead and send it on because some of you uh, would like to help them, but you're maybe not able to tonight. So uh, we've tried to do something. I think we took a love offering earlier. Did, did y'all get that from, from us? We took a love offering. Didn't we do that, Brother David? Did we send a love offering earlier? Did we send that? <laughs> we had a meeting last night, and uh, people, I, I explained to the folks in that meeting that David handles all of our mission money. So if David's driving a new car, <laughs> and uh, our missionaries are not getting any support, but... Uh, Make sh- double check, make sure they got that. They, sh- they should have got that months ago, several months ago, so make sure they got that. Take your Bibles tonight, the book of 1 Peter, continuing our study of the Word of God. And uh, we're in 1 Peter again tonight, 1 Peter chapter 4. And uh, find 1 Peter 4, page number 1,315, if you use an old Schofield Bible. 1 Peter chapter number 4. Uh, hold your place there. Tyler's going to come sing for us with his dad accompanying. And uh, we appreciate Brother Tyler and Brother Ed. You sing for us. no secret that God's favorite instrument is a mandolin. It's in the Greek somewhere. Amen. Take your Bible, 1 Peter chapter 4. Look at verse number 7 with me tonight. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse number 7. Thank you, Brother Tyler. Thank you, Brother Ed. The Bible says, but the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober, watch unto prayer, and above all things have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. Use hospitality one to another without grudging, as every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do it as of the ability which God giveth, that God in all things may be glorified 
through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. Amen. First Peter chapter 4, we're continuing our study uh, verse by verse through the book of First Peter. And uh, last week we looked at verses uh, we looked at verse 6, the, the gospel message. Uh, what is the gospel message? And, uh, we, we have such a uh, miscommunication nowadays of what the gospel message is. And folks have really uh, co- made the gospel complicated. Uh, the gospel is not as complicated as some would want to think. The gospel is the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, there are other doctrines after the gospel, but before the gospel, there is nothing else need to be preached to man. Man doesn't need our uh, doctrine if they don't know Christ. What good would it be to have the right doctrine on the local church if you know not the Christ of the local church? And uh, so we've got to keep the message correct, the gospel. And uh, we talked about the audience of the gospel. And you remember last week. And then we come to this phrase here in verse number 7 where we have an admonition by the apostle that the end of all things is near. The end of all things is at hand. Uh, And then he gives us uh, several things. But how many of you have ever seen this guy right here on the side of the road? This guy right here, just... Just he's got the cardboard box and and he and he he's, he's normally uh, vagrant looking. I don't want to be unkind, but he's normally kind of rough looking. And and you're thinking the homeless guy. I mean, he may not be homeless, but you're thinking the homeless guy. And he's got his sign and and uh, he's he's yelling at the cars going by. You know, the end is near. The end is near. And uh, you see that guy. And what is your first reaction when you see homeless guy holding up the sign? The end is near. Nutcase. Wacko, drug addict, (laughs) burnout. The end is near, guy, right? Uh, The truth is, he's right. But here's the question I have. Not not my first thought of drug addict, crazy guy, loon, independent fundamental Baptist. (laughs) That's next, you know. By the way, our guys were street preaching in London for the Olympics, uh, but they were actually street preaching to people. You ever seen the guy on the side of the road that's preaching to the highway? You must be putting in. Because the cars are, you must be born again. Uh, If you're going to street preach, get a crowd together and preach to people. Don't preach to the intersection where cars are blind. You must be born again. I don't understand that. So you see, crazy guy, he's right. But have you ever thought about what end? You know, when Peter writes this in uh, 1 Peter 4, he he writes this, the end of all things is near. The end of the end of all things is at hand. The end of all things is at hand. Now, uh, you look at that, and, and your first thought may be the end of time. And that, that's something we'll look at in just a moment. But I want to let you consider a couple other things as I did my reading and research this week. Uh, you know, Peter could have been talking the end of all things as in the end of some of the trials and difficulties uh, that were going on. Because if you study the book of 1 Peter, uh, you know that there are some difficulties that we go through in the Christian life. There are some troubles and some trials and some heartaches and some rough things along the way. And so he could be talking about the end of of those things is near. Uh, But he could be talking, second of all, uh, in the announcement, by the way, Brother Steve, uh, the announcement being made here, he could be talking about uh, the end of the nation of Israel. Uh, You know that the nation of Israel was already under a Roman oppression. Uh, By 61, 62 A.D., uh, the Romans would completely annihilate the city of Jerusalem. Uh, They would destroy the temple. They would just devastate uh, Jerusalem. They would devastate Israel. There would be nothing left. And the diaspora would be in place, the dispersion, uh, where the nation of Israel from 61, 62 A.D. until 1947, uh, almost 2,000 years would be dispersed. And he could have been talking about the end of Israel, the end of their uh, country, their nation, uh, their heritage, their culture, the end of all these things is near. Uh, And then he could have been talking about uh, the end of life, uh, the end of life. How shocked were we today when Keith said, uh, Pastor, did you hear about the third year student at Clearwater whose life was taken Friday in an accident? Uh, This kid was getting ready to enroll for his junior year uh, and he was killed in a a motorcycle accident. Uh, The truth is, uh, if you said the end is near to 100 people, for somebody, you're probably right. Somebody, the end of their life, probably right now. 
And then he could say uh, the end of the church age. The end of the church age is near. Uh, You understand the New Testament disciple, uh, they thought that the Lord was going to immediately come back. Uh, That's why in Acts chapter uh, 1, as they see him going up, this same Jesus, so come again, like man, you've seen him go. They thought that he was immediately going to come back and set up the kingdom and the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. And uh, they would go right into that age, uh, the church age is at hand, the end of the church age. So what is the end that he's speaking of? Well, I think honestly you could take several of these things and make a point out of it, but I do think this, whatever he was talking about, whether it's the end of your trials, your tribulations, your difficulties, as we just heard from Brother Earnhardt, they've had a very difficult year. Uh, The end of that hopefully is coming, and there's going to be some better days. Uh, The end of Israel, we know that was the case, that they went through that great dispersion the end of life, the end of church, whatever it is, the truth of the matter is it doesn't matter whatever it is because the end is always near. So Brother Sansa, I don't understand. Uh, He made a great statement. I hope you caught that. A church can be over with overnight. A church can be done. This church, as it is, you give this church a a few weeks of wrong direction, God could take his hand off this church. Your family, as good, as strong, as solid as it is, uh, it doesn't take long uh, before your family. Uh, You could have the end of your job, the end of your uh, family, the end of your church, the end of health, the end of whatever. And we all know that looking at the signs of the time, we certainly believe we're in the last days of the church age. If you have any doubt about that, if there's any any conflict in your mind that we're in the last days of the last days before the return of Christ, uh, listen, you see these things begin to come to pass. Lift up your head, your redemption draweth nigh. We are living in prophecy being fulfilled before our very eyes. And we're watching this. And so Peter makes the announcement in verse number 7, but the end of all things is at hand. The end of all things is at hand. You say, Brother Sansa, I want to live a long time. I do too. But the truth is, this may be my last message. I hope you live a long time. I hope you have a great long life. But the truth is, this could be your last service. I will never forget. I will never forget preaching a Sunday just like this, a great Sunday. We had a wonderful Sunday. And I'll never forget Monday morning walking into my office and uh, just sitting down to begin the process of of gearing up for the week uh, when my secretary said, Pastor, get down to St. Mary's right now. Bob Hinton has had a stroke. Bob Hinton is our church back in Texas. Bob Hinton would be this church's Jim Morton. Same demeanor, same spirit, same role, chairman of our deacon board. Bob Hinton had gotten up on Monday morning after that great weekend of service, that great weekend of church. 8 o'clock, we prayed together at the altar. Uh, 10 o'clock, Sunday school. 11 o'clock, church. 6 o'clock, the service. Go home with his precious wife. And uh, that morning, he got up to mow his yard, and he had a massive stroke, and he never was the same again. And I buried him just a few years later. The end is near. And it doesn't matter if it's the church. It doesn't matter if it's your life. It doesn't matter whatever it is. You cannot live like you're going to live forever. One of the biggest problems I have with this generation, and I love this generation. That's why we have our single adult conferences. That's why we try to invest in single adults. But one of the biggest problems I have, and and as a school teacher in, in our schools, our young people, you know this to be true. One of the biggest problems we have is this generation is so short sighted. They never think about anything but right now. The truth of the matter is, you better consider you may stand before the Lord. You may not have a long time to get things turned around and get things going uh, because uh, you may give an account. So, number one, we see the announcement. The Bible is very clear. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, because the Spirit of the Lord bloweth upon it. Surely the people is grass. The analogy there is this, as the grass lives and dies, so is our life. And we know that from James 4. Our life is but a vapor here for a moment, then vanisheth away. So he gives us the announcement, the end is near. So Peter is the guy that you see on the road. The end is near. But then Peter does something that the guy on the road doesn't do. He gives us an urgent admonition, an urgent admonition. He said, "Uh, the end of all things is near. Therefore, every time you see the therefore, It's the continuation of the thought. So because the end is near, whether it's the church or life or the church age, whatever it is, he said, therefore, verse number eight, uh, he said, verse number seven, therefore, be sober. 
Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. And above all things have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. Use hospitality one to another without grudging, as every man hath received the gift. Even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. All right, if we are going to give an account of our life, if the end is near, if we only have right now, you better, therefore, you better have some things in line. You better do some things. I spoke to some of our men and women last night about the urgency of this ministry that we have, this local church. And there's some principles that I want to give you. I want to give you six or seven. Uh, number one, he said, if the end is near, if we were going to give an account tomorrow, live soberly. Now, this is not about being drunk with wine. In fact, the next phrase actually deals with that, and I'll explain it to you in a moment. But this is not about being sober, not stoned or drunk. But this, this is in the idea of being serious-minded, being temperate in our lifestyle, being moderate, being sound, a uh, person of a sound mind or of a right mind to live soberly. To, to live, listen, with a seriousness about you of the things of God. It, this thing of church is not take it or leave it. This thing of your Christian walk, uh, it is not uh, just uh, uh, the weekend activity. It is not a better choice. It is our life. It is either an all or nothing proposition. Either we're in or we're out. It is not something we do. It is really who we are. So many of us, we put on the weekend Christian outfit, and then we live our life the rest of the week, and we can kind of separate the Christian us from the world us. The truth is, uh, that's no Christian life at all. If you're not who you are uh, in the work day as who you are in the weekend, uh, you're not a consistent, faithful Christian to live soberly. Have a mindset of the seriousness about it. Uh, everybody you meet is a candidate for eternal life, heaven or hell, and they need a gospel witness, and they need a gospel encouragement, and they need somebody. And if we don't take our job seriously, we'll miss an opportunity to impact someone for the cause of Christ. Number two, live watching. This Actually, this word watching is actually the word we would translate this out. This does have to do uh, with being sober, abstaining from wine. What it really connotates and what it really means is uh, to watch or to be uh, not given to wine, not given to fleshly appetites. Be watching. Uh, be, be not so consumed with this world, the things of this world, the activities of this world. The delights of this world. It's amazing to me, and I, I, I thank the Lord, I, to be honest, I thank the Lord I'm getting a little older, a little bit, a little bit far down the road, but it's amazing to me how, how much we are controlled, listen, by people who do not matter. What, what do I care what the Kardashians ever do? They're, they're mental, listen, they're mental pygmies. They're spiritually nothing. They're, they're not, listen, I'm, I'm not, if they walked in, we'd love them, thank God for them. I don't care who she marries. Her, inf her idea on politics matters to me like the man in the moon. And yet people tune in to see what the Kardashians are doing. By the way, Bruce Jenner looked better on the box of Wheaties in 76 than he does now. Plastic surgery is not kind to some people. Him and, him and uh, Joan Rivers should get together and see who could have a face-off right there. In fact, they could probably switch each other's faces. But anyway, <laughs> the Kardashians and uh, uh, the, the Jersey Shore people and the American Idol people and the, this people and the, that people, and, and, and we've got to find out what everybody, why in the world would we care what they think? Here's why, because we're indulging our fleshly appetites. We're so consumed. This, this reality TV, listen, it is not reality TV. It is unreal TV. The modern family and all these other new shows that are twisted perversions of what a real family is, uh, we should not be influenced by this. Live watching. Let, uh, pulling away from fleshly desires. Pulling away from the enticements of the world. Uh, just a... a, a, a a complete, uh, just a complete carnal church, a very Corinthian-like church to where we have more and more religion and less and less holiness. 
more and more activity, less and less spirituality, where there is a lot of, of things going on, but really the Lord's not in the midst of it all. He says, live watching, live soberly. He said, number three, uh, live praying, watching unto prayer. And the word here, unto prayer, uh, giving to earnest prayer. I've enjoyed, listen, I've enjoyed, to be honest with you, I've enjoyed the last few months at our church. There is a little bit of growth in our prayer movement. We're seeing more men coming into our prayer times before uh, the Sunday morning service and before the Sunday evening service. And we have the once a month thing for our missions band and we have the ladies prayer group. You say, preacher, uh, is there enough prayer? The answer is no, there's never enough prayer. But thank God there's more prayer. And this idea of praying is not just, uh, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray, Lord, my soul to keep. There's an idea of earnest prayer. Listen, we have not because we ask not. Dr. uh, Dr. Rice used to say, all of our failures are prayer failures. Before we go to anybody else, before we go to Facebook, before we go anywhere else, are we going to God in prayer? Praying church. A praying church, praying for each other, praying for one another with with their needs and burdens, praying for power, praying for for wisdom, praying for direction, praying for souls to be saved. When's the last time we prayed for the lost? Prayed for the lost that they'd come into our service and be saved or that we would go to their homes, their communities, their neighborhoods and lead them to Christ. Uh, We are in dire need of some prayer warriors. I appreciate the other day I I mentioned this on Twitter the other night. I was talking to Ron Fisher. and uh, You know, Ron is very tender, very sensitive, and and, uh, he just weeps and weeps when we stand together and talk at the nursing home there. He said, I can't do anything. He's talking about his legs. and, And I said, Ron, the one thing that you can do and the one thing I need you to do more than anything else is would you pray for me? And with great tears, he said, Pastor, I pray for you all day, every day. Now listen, that means much to us because we're learning as we get a little older. It's not our program or personality. It's not our ability. It's not what we can manufacture. It is the power of God, and the power of God only comes uh, through earnest prayer. Through earnest prayer. Every great revival was not started with preaching. It was started with prayer. Every great church, the key, I remember talking to the pastor of the church in Texas that had really, the Lord had used to build before there was the downturn and before there was the trouble. And then we came in, the Lord allowed us to come in later. But the pastor that was there in the 60s and 70s said, "Uh, Brother Stancil, let me tell you the secret of of Valverde Baptist Church. He said, you see, that tower right there, and there was a great prayer tower. And it was worthless. It was nothing. There was no Sunday school rooms in it. There was nothing of value to it. He said, uh, in fact, we, we, we just felt it was a, an albatross because uh, the rain was coming in, and it was moldy, and it was smelly. And, and I mean, it was just a, an eyesore. It looked like a castle. It was really a weird uh, shape for a building. And, and uh, he said, Brent, uh, he said, the secret of Valverde Baptist Church was every Saturday night for years and years and years, a bunch of men would meet up in the top of that prayer tower, and we would pray and pray and pray and pray for the service to come. He said, that's how God built this church. We, we need earnest prayer. Why? Because the end is near. If you're going to, listen, if you're going to meet him soon, you ought to know him before you meet him. Number three, live praying. Live loving. Live loving. I, I love this verse. Live loving. Above all things have, look at the word fervent I like the word fervent. It's a good old word. Fervent. Fervent charity. Above all things. That means, listen, do all this other stuff. But above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves. For charity shall cover the multitude of sins. Fervent love. Charity is the word love here. We understand that. That's an easy translation. Fervent love, one for another. For It'll cover a multitude of sins. Oh, yeah, Brother Sanso, you do wicked, and we're going to love you and cover it up. That's not what that means. It's not at all what that means. Let me have a, a moment of, of Baptist teaching to you, independent Baptist teaching. Independent Baptists for years were guilty of covering sin in the name of love. Oh, we don't want to hurt the pastor. We don't want to hurt the church. You destroy the church. You destroy the pastor when you don't deal with sin. Pastor gets in sin. People get in sin. Don't hide it. Deal with it biblically. And, and, and listen, I hope to God I never find myself, hope to God you never find yourself in anything that has to be dealt with in that way. But love is not covering sin. But love is dealing with sin the biblical way. And we've had to watch that the last few weeks, some things being dealt with. And listen, I applaud those churches. As Brother Earnhardt said, listen, 
Pastor, we love you, but, but you're out here. This is, this is not a matter of do we like you or not. This is a matter of are you qualified. And there's 14 biblical qualifications for a pastor. And when you fail them, you're out. You, you, you have to accept that. Love is not covering sin. It doesn't say it covers up sin. What it says is it, it allows you to overlook others. When they, when they don't measure up to your standard, you're not so stinking critical. You're not so hard. You're not, you're not, you're not so nitpicky. I'm so glad that, that we do not have God judging us as we judge others. It's amazing. We, we're running around like an inspector gadget with a magnifying glass on everybody in the world. Uh, and we're running around here with, with, with our own issues, never bothering to look at that. But, but so-and-so does this, and so-and-so does that, and so-and-so does that. Uh, love says, you know what? They're human. I'll give them some room. Again, if it's a sin, if it's a, listen, you break the law, we're going to do one thing. We're going to call the police. We're not going to do an internal audit or an internal investigation. We're going to turn the situation over to the police. That's the law. If there's a sin issue that's not a legal issue, but it's a church issue, we're going to deal with it as a church. We're going to follow the steps in Matthew 16 and the other places in the Bible. But mark this down. Uh, if it's something that's not a legal issue or it's not a disqualification issue, we're not a bunch of Gestapo agents running around here trying to find out what everybody else is doing. I've had, to, I've had to do church discipline over the years, and I hate that. I hate it, but I'll do it. I have done it. Do it again. And every case was not something that I went out and found. It was a case that was brought to me that I could not avoid dealing with. And it became known. You have to deal with it publicly. But when you live loving, you're not so busy trying to find what's wrong with everybody. Hey, listen, watch this. You're trying to find what's right with everybody. You know, there's more things you agree with people about than you disagree with people about. There's more reasons to love people than to dislike people. And I, I can't stand that spirit or attitude where we are so busy trying to measure up and have others measure up to some supposed standard that, that we don't understand. Love allows me to overlook. My wife, for 19 years, coming up in, a, in another couple of days, we'll be married 19 years. Listen, you know what love does? Love allows her to overlook a multitude of sins. You know why people get divorced? Because they don't really love each other. Because this begins to bother them, and that begins to bother them. And, this, and finally, they go to the judge, and you say, why are you getting a divorce? Well, she can't cook eggs. What? Yeah, she can't cook. She, she does this, and she does that, and she does. And, and you know, listen, every long-term marriage that's ever made it many, many years Wife couldn't cook or husband couldn't do this. There have been the same issues. There have been the same problems because there is, our marriage isn't lasting and your marriage isn't lasting because uh, uh, just the fact that she could cook eggs. Our marriage is lasting and those marriages that last a long time last because love says, I'm not going to let that small, insignificant, non-important thing take down this wonderful thing that God's given me. And, and when, you, when you're... That's really killing me, y'all. I, I tell you what, we're going to take the cushion and we're going to put it up here. When, when, when you're so... The only word I can think of is ignorant here because it's a, it's a good word. When you're so ignorant that you think you're going to do better the next time, oh, I got to get rid of this one because Mr. So-and-so has got it all figured out. There's no man... There's no woman going to be any different. Why? Because it's not a them problem. It's a you problem. Love overlooks some things. Love, listen, Valerie's not perfect. I'm not perfect. But overall, we've got such a great thing going. I'm not going to let the things that bother me tear down the things that God's blessed me with. Same is true in our marriage. Same is true in our church. Listen, you know, if we wanted to put the list of what's wrong with Pastor Sansel on the board, we could be here for hours and hours. And I could start over here with Jacob and go all the way through to Ben, and we could put what's wrong with you, and it would be here for days and weeks and weeks. The truth is, love says, I don't have to have a perfect church. I have to have a loving church. And nobody here is going to meet everybody else's standards. There's going to be some issues. There's going to be some problems. And this person doesn't see this way. Now, there, there's things you have to correct. There's things you have to deal with. I'm not saying you let everything slide. There's no utopia. There's no Zion. Okay, there's no perfect place. 
And so there's, there's always growth, and there's always a transition, and there's always change. And, and that, that's not evil. That's not wrong. Uh, there, there's always striving for excellence. We talked about that uh, the other evening. Uh, but the truth is uh, there's also a lot of room to say, hey, I love you, and I'm going to give God time to work on you, and I'm not going to hold you to a higher standard than I want to be held. Why? Because we're going to meet the Lord, and he's going to judge us with the same measure that we've judged others. That's why I'm a wide loop kind of guy. I want to give a lot of room. You know why? Because I want to have a lot of room. Now, if I fail as a pastor, if I'm not meeting my qualifications as a pastor, I need to step down. I understand that. And you, you would do wrong to overlook the qualifications if, 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 if somebody in our staff or somebody in our church, if they're not doing the job, there's a difference there. We're not talking about overlooking fault or wrong, but we are talking about loving so that we're not always trying to be critical. It's interesting. You can choose how you see people. You can have a, a, a lens that sees people with a critical spirit or with a loving spirit. And I'm going to try my best to choose the loving spirit. Now, look at the next one. We must hasten. I like saying we must hasten. The next one, live lovingly. Live. He says in verse number uh, 9, Use hospitality one to another without grudging. Uh, we must live hosting, live with hospitality, live with hospitality. Uh, given to hospitality is a requirement of pastors. Hosting, getting to know. Uh, we, we said this in our meeting tonight. Uh, shepherds are to smell like sheep. We're to, we're to know what our people are like. We're to be around them. And uh, there is no leadership mystique where the pastor is to be separate from the people and the people are not to be close to the pastor. Uh, there's no way you can lead from that position correctly or biblically. So I asked the question, uh, and by the way, I think we're really growing strongly. We're making great strides in this. But when's the last time you as an older member of community invited a younger member of community to go to lunch with you or dinner with you or to your house uh, uh, or meet somewhere or have an activity together? You know who's, he's not here tonight, I didn't think he would be, uh, I would have said it if he was here or not. You know who's excellent about this? Harmon Carroll. Harmon Carroll, now if you don't know who Harmon Carroll is, he's the older man that sits back here about where, the, where Keith and Ryan are sitting right now. And uh, I, I don't know, but Harmon, is, is he 90? He's not here tonight, is he? Is he 90? How old is Harmon? 80 something? 80. Now he's, he's upper mid 80s. Huh? And he, he's now, if you've noticed, he's got a, a permanent crook now and he kind of walks with a cane. Do you know who Harmon hangs out with? Matt and Rebecca. New couple. And, and, and hey, he don't cut you no slack, does he, Matt? Y'all need to join the church. Now, we're trying to help him on the, the, the slowly loving them in. Y'all need to join the church. Matt, you need to get baptized. And, but, but it's interesting to me. Here's one of the oldest guys in the church, walks with a walker, and yet every new person here, well, he's going to say hey to him. And you watch him. You watch. Some of you guys, you watch. After a service, uh, we'll all be dispersing and doing our thing, and Harmon be looking for people he doesn't know. And he'll be, hey, and what does he do? He'll take you to eat, won't he? And he'll fellowship with you and get to know you. And he'll try to make sure you're saved, baptized, and try to help you join the church. Hey, Harmon's figured out hospitality. Now, we're, we're working on that. We're striving on that. But, but it's, it can't be. Our church is growing to the point now where we can't do everything for everybody. So it thrills me when, when I find out, hey, Miss Kelly's got a group over here, or Brother So-and-So's got a group over here, or this group's going out, or this group's meeting for breakfast and having some prayer time. Uh, we must get together more than one hour a week. One hour a week is not a church family. The churches that meet one hour a week, we were talking about that. Where were we at Sunday school this morning? I want to look over. There you are. Sit where you're supposed to sit. Uh, we were talking about in Sunday school this morning. Uh, we wonder about the churches that, that they're open from 9 to 10, 10 to 11, uh, one hour a week. That's not a church. A church is men getting to know each other and bearing one another's burdens so we might fulfill the law of Christ and, and laughing together and crying together and ministering together. And, and, and it's getting to know people. It's opening up your, your home. Oh, Brother Sanson, we don't have time. Listen, this is the thing we're going to meet God about, Right? How we love the brethren. This is how that all men shall know you're my disciples if you have love one to another. If I'm going to give an account on my love meter, I ought to have some folks in my home and, and to our house and out to dinner with them and, and do some fun things and do some ministry things and some service things and labor together and love together and serve together. 
Use hospitality. Very important. I love when people come to our church and they make the statement, man, we just feel at home here. That's a big deal to me because I want people to know uh, this is a place you can fit in. Uh, wherever you stand, whatever you look like, however you are, uh, you can fit in here. So uh, love hosting, or live hosting, live with hospitality. And then he says the next verse, he says, verse 10, uh, as every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another as the good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Now, I won't take time to preach all this tonight, but the gift of grace, God has given each of us the gift of grace. God has also given us these specific gifts. Specific gifts. And so we are to live ministering to the needs of others. He said, Brother Sanson, what's my gift set? Whatever. I talked about this morning. Whatever's in your hand, use that. Brother Frank has ministered to me because he's helped me with some electrical problems. Uh, Brother Bill uh, has helped us with some plumbing things. And and others have helped us with this or with that. Uh, Every person in this room has a gift set. Well, what am I to do with that? You're to help somebody else in the church who doesn't have that gift set. Some of you have the gift of service. You have the gift of serving people. And, 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 and I love to see that where people are meeting the needs. And some of you have other gifts. And we could go down that list. And in fact, we will at some point. We'll walk down through some of the spiritual gifts and some of the things that God's done. Our job is to take what God has put in our hand, mix it into the gumbo that is our local church, and use that to help other people. It's amazing if you think about everything that we need to make this church Highly functioning is sitting right here if we could get everybody to put their gift in the pot. If we could get everybody on board, there's no telling what we could accomplish. We, listen, you say, Pastor, boy, we need to reach more kids. I will buy the buses if we had the drivers. Oh, Brother Sanson, we could do more Bible clubs. I would rent the rooms if we could get more volunteers. Oh, Brother Sanson, we could do a better job with, with the choir. I would do that if we had people that showed up, uh, so on and so forth. Whatever our problem, whatever our weakness, God's already fulfilling it, or he's about to fulfill it by putting that in because God knows our needs, so he puts people in the church to specifically meet those needs. It's amazing how that happens. It's just that we're so casual about our Christianity nowadays that we we find it hard to to use our gifts to minister one to another. Now, I want you to notice one last truth and we'll be done. Verse 11, we see, we see the announcement, the end of all things is at hand. We see the admonition and we have six things, six ways we're to live. But then notice this, the authority, the authority for which we minister, for which we speak, for which we preach. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. Literally, this this means speak as God has spoken to us. Now, we know that as God has spoken to us through his word, through his word. So, as any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do it as of the ability which God giveth, that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise, dominion forever and ever. Amen. Speak as the oracles of God. Our authority is the word of God. Our authority is the word of God. Now listen, it is imperative that everything we do be based and centered and chained to the word of God. Take your Bible. I want you to look at one. I want you to find this. Find the Old Testament book of Jeremiah. We won't read a lot of it, but find Jeremiah Jeremiah was the prophet. He was proclaiming, prophesying to Israel. Jeremiah 23, if you have your Bible, find Jeremiah 23. And begin reading in verse 25. I want you to see something. Jeremiah 23, verse 25. And I'm going I'm to get to the, the meat of this and, and, and bring it to a close. Verse 25, the book of Jeremiah, chapter 23. I have heard what the prophet said that prophesy lies in my name, saying, I have dreamed, I have dreamed. How long shall this be in the heart of the prophets that prophesy lies? Yea, they are prophets of the deceit of their own tongue, which think to cause my people to forget my name by their dreams, which they tell every man to his neighbor, as their fathers have forgotten my name for Baal. The prophet that hath a dream, let him tell it as let him tell a dream, and he that hath my word, let him speak my word faithfully. What is the chaff to the wheat? 
saith the Lord, is not my word like a fire, saith the Lord, and like a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces. Therefore, behold, I am against the prophets, saith the Lord, that steal my words, every one from his neighbor. Behold, I am against the prophets, saith the Lord, that use their tongues, and, he, uh, and say, he saith, behold, I am against them that prophesy false dreams, saith the Lord, and do tell them, and cause my people to err by their lies and by their likeness. Yet I sent them not, nor commanded them, therefore they shall not profit this people at all, saith the Lord. You could read on verses 33 on down through the end of that chapter. But I want you to notice when men speak and, and they say they're speaking for God, if they're not preaching the word, we're not to give them heed. Now, I think two things. One, I think there are some men who are deceitful. I think that they use the word of God deceitfully they have figured out religion is a money-making game and if they can con you into giving they will say whatever it takes and, and we were talking about this in Sunday school again uh, when you watch a 30-minute television show and 29 minutes is about the offering there's a problem I, I think there's some you say oh brother Sam so I was watching so and so on TV I give very little credence to a lot of what I see uh, on the television and here on the radio because there are some con men and I, I, listen, I'm not going to hurt anybody's feelings because I may say your favorite preacher, but there are a lot of men, hopefully that I wouldn't hurt many of your feelings, but there are a lot of men and, and some women, whatever, uh, who are just lost, unsaved, pawns of Satan, using the word of God to get money. Now, I wouldn't hurt your feelings for anything, but there, there's a long list. If you want to see me afterward, I'll tell you people like Benny Hinn and Peter Popoff and uh, Tillman and all, all those money-grubbing false prophets. Amen. But then, and this is where we get a little bit, yeah. Then there's some good men who say things that aren't Bible. They're not evil. They love the Lord. They'll be, they'll, and listen, I'm guilty as a dog. I've done it. I, will, I hope to God I don't do it, but I may do it again. But sometimes you can begin something that, boy, it, how many of you heard those old sayings and you think, man, that, that sounds like Bible and it's not. Benjamin Franklin said it or some other guy said it, you know. Two birds in the bush, two birds in the hands worth one in the bush. That's got to be in the Old Testament somewhere. No, man, that's Benjamin Franklin, you know. And so the, the, these guys get up and they, they, start, they start talking about something and, uh, and all of a sudden, boy, they've got us in a, a froth because they're good preachers and, and they're preaching along and, and they're saying this and that. And, and then you stop and you look at your text and you realize that's not what the Bible says. <clears throat> much, much topical preaching, much topical preaching is about the topic and not the text. That's how we can build major ministries on philosophy and worldly wisdom. When, when preachers say things like this, uh, uh, here's, our, here's our text verse. Uh, you can close your Bibles. We won't be coming back there again. Now, listen, I'm afraid of that. Now, nowadays, I'm afraid of that. If, if God say, uh, you, you know, uh, just look up here. You don't have to look at your Bibles. That makes me nervous now. Right? Because, you know, I can pretty much, and I'm, I'm not a bad person. Orator, if I really wanted to, I could make you laugh and make you cry. I could probably lead a group. And I'm, I'm not as good as a lot of those guys. We must chain ourselves to the text of the Word of God. Amen. And I find this to be true. What a lot of the world says about us is true. Now, you, 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 you want to defend that because, well, we're independent, fundamental Baptists. They're right. When we say things, and I, I, I listen, I have to be so careful now. Everything we do goes out on the Internet and, and out there. If we're not preaching the Word of God and we start making snide comments and, and say things silly and hurtful, they don't understand the spirit of our family. They don't understand our church. And all they hear is that, listen, they do think we're bigoted. They do think we're, we're, we, they think we hate them. We, we, 
we have got to preach the Word of God. Now listen, I can preach everything the Word of God has, and they can still get upset because the mind of the natural man and the Word of God are not going to come together. But listen, let them get mad at the Word of God, not me making some stupid statement about the Word of God. The authority that I have is not my words. And, and, and we could go on to Paul. He said, I didn't come with you preaching the wisdom of words. He said, I, I came preaching the Word of God. The Word of God. The Christians, the Berean Christians, they listened to Paul preach, but they, they made sure he was preaching the Word of God. And much, 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 and I'm not against topics. I think we ought to preach topical messages at times. But listen, much of what we do is we get ourselves in trouble because we preach our own idea or philosophy. And we say something we should not say because we're not chained to the text. And I would give you some examples, but I don't feel that's necessary. Some things that guys say and you're like, no, don't say that. I remember, I'm going to say this. I remember years ago I was in a service and the guy went railing on, on homosexuality, railing. I mean, just using the words and all the different uh, connotations, all the negative things, railing. And I remember thinking to myself, number one, if there was a lost homosexual in this crowd, he ain't listening. He ain't li Anything else has happened. I remember, uh, let me finish that thought, and then I got another thought. Uh, they're coming. I just get schizophrenic. Uh, the same service, I'm thinking... If there's a mother of a homosexual who's brokenhearted for her wayward child, and she's hearing that, she ain't going to bring her son or daughter to church because she don't want them to get a dose of that when they visit. Had a guy one time, and listen, I'm, I think the Catholic Church's doctrine is false doctrine. The, the Catholic Church teaches a false gospel. There, there's no salvation in Mary. There's no salvation in sacraments. There's no salvation in, in there, there's no salvation outside of Lord Jesus Christ. And, and if you, if, if I'm preaching on doctrine, and I say uh, that that there is none other name given under heaven whereby you must be saved. Uh, listen, there's no merit. I don't have a problem with that. That's, that's Bible. See, there's Bible doctrine about the doctrine of the Word of God and false doctrine. I can preach against that all day long. But listen, I want to win Catholic people to Christ. And so when I get up and say uh, names and call names and call the priest names and call the church names and call the pope names. Now listen, do I think that, that, that some of those titles in the Revelation apply there? Absolutely. And can I preach Revelation clearly and apply some of that? Yes, because it's a false church and false doctrine. But I don't need to offend needlessly. And so I had a missionary, missionary, uh, come in and, 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 and man... I'm, I don't know if you remember that or not. It was, it was, uh, we were, we were, and we were right after Rita because we were meeting in. Uh, no, it wasn't Rita. It was, it was the tornado. It was ninety nine. We were meeting in uh, that Conqueror's classroom on a Wednesday night and had a missionary in, and I mean he just went off. He went off and saying all kind of jokes about Catholicism and the Catholic Church and being funny. And I'm thinking, number one, that ain't funny. Number two, if I had a Catholic lost friend here, I'll never get them back. And now I'm very careful. I'm trying to be careful. My point is, uh, the oracles of God. Do you notice? Listen, and, and Brother Earnhardt, you know this to be true. A lot of our guys get in trouble, but it's not for preaching the Bible. Now they say, uh, people are mad at me because I preach the Bible. No, people are mad at you because you're an idiot. You said something silly. And they're, they're calling, don't touch the man of God. Yeah, you didn't preach the Bible. I have a right and authority to, to, to hold you accountable to the word of God. By the way, just finish that thought. A lot of churches uh, lose sight of that. And that's when the pastor begins to lead them in all kind of other crazy doctrine. Just crazy stuff. The oracles of God. When we speak, it's got to be the word of God. Now, look at the second thing. When we minister, it's got to be the grace of God. The grace of God, I won't take time to read Romans 12. I spent some time teaching through this last night. But Romans 12, listen, we have to minister as ministers of the grace of God. What we've been given, we give to others. What we do, we're to do uh, everything we're to do, whatsoever we're to do, it's all to the glory of God. It's all for His glory, for His honor. And so as we minister to others, and Romans 12 gives a whole list of ministries and things uh, that we're to do there and that we're to serve. And we're to do that not for our glory or our, admin or, or our uh, 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 
honor, but it's for his honor, his glory. And, and it's so important that we remember that we serve in his place. We're his hands, his feet, his mouth. And, and so we're not saying, oh, look at what I'm doing. Look at what I'm doing. Did you notice me? Did you see what I did? Did you see what I did? Uh, watch this, watch this. We're saying, let's get all the honor and glory we can to him. And we minister. By the way, it's his grace that he's given us that we have to minister to in the first place. Minister. Verse 11, as we minister, let us do it to the ability which God giveth, that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be, to him be praise and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Are we living, I'm, I'm, I'll say this and be finished, are we living so that everything we do brings honor, as best we can, brings honor and glory and praise to God? It's, it's, a, it's a simple self-test. Why do I do what I do? Why do I not do what I do? Is it so that people can, can say, oh, look at how he's turned life around. Look at how she's doing this. Or look at how they're doing this. Or is it, man, the Lord's just been good to me. And what God's given me, I'd like to share with you. And this is all because of him. Minister is the grace of God. Uh, we, we minister. We minister to others, listen, as we've been ministered to. As God's been so good and kind and gracious, merciful to us, we minister in the same way. The end of all things is near. Now, I hope we all live a long time the rapture comes. But truth is, number one, we could die tonight. Number two, he could come tonight and we'll give an account. Therefore, let us live soberly, watching, prayer, loving, hospitality, uh, with hospitality. Chained to the word of God as ministers of the grace of God. It makes a difference when you realize, you know what, I could give an account tomorrow. I better be prepared. I don't want, I don't want to go to the Lord with a bad spirit. I don't want to go to the Lord, listen, I don't want to go to the Lord not forgiving someone else when I'm asking him to forgive me. I don't want to go to the Lord with a bitterness about me. Let's stop. We could preach some more. Father, we love you. We're never done with the word of God. Never. It's such an awesome book. It lives. It teaches. It, it, it's food. And yet, Lord, we have to quit because of time. Lord, the thought is very clear to us. The end of all things is near. We believe, just looking at Scripture, studying the Word of God, that the end of this age is near. Give way soon to uh, the rapture, the tribulation, the millennial kingdom. And so, Lord, help us to live in such a way. Lord, I pray our church. I, I want our church to be that, that place of rest, that place of Uh, that people come to be refreshed, to be re-energized, to be recharged, uh, Lord, uh, to be revived, that we might go out to a very lost and a very dying world with the good news of Christ. And uh, so, Lord, I pray for our church family tonight. Please let us love the Word of God and minister to others as the grace of God in us. Help us to live the right way, we pray. Let's stand to our feet. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. If you're here tonight and, and the Lord's speaking to you about giving an account, how we're living, how we're loving, ministering, serving, thinking about the Word of God, maybe something else the Lord's doing your heart about, Mark begins to lead us in a song. You step out of your place and come. Jesus, keep me near the cross. Folks are coming. You step out. There a precious fountain. They're watching, they're praying. How's our prayer line? Earnest prayer. Free to all a healing stream flows from Calvary's mountain. In the cross, in the cross, be my glory ever, till my raptured soul shall find rest beyond the river. Maybe you're here tonight and you have another need to be baptized or join a good Bible-believing church. You need to pray with somebody. Brother David's available. Others are here, our deacons, our staff. Maybe you got a burden. Maybe, maybe you just want to pray for the Earnhardts or maybe your own family, some needs you have. We'll sing another verse. 
Take this opportunity. Pray earnestly. Pray for RU on Thursday night. Pray for the bus ministry on Wednesday night. Pray for the institute on Monday night. Pray for Wednesday night church. Pray for honor our heroes. You pray as Mark leads. Near the cross, a trembling soul. Love and mercy found me. There the bright and morning star sheds its beams around me. You know what we'll sing now? In the cross, in the cross, be my glory ever till my raptured soul shall find rest we'll sing one more beyond the river. You come, whatever you need is, you come. This will be the last verse. Near the cross, O Lamb of God, bring it scenes before me. Help me walk from day to day with its shadows over right, me. Big, big choir. Let's sing. In the cross, in the cross, be my glory ever till my raptured soul shall find rest beyond the river. All right. All God's people said? Amen. I've enjoyed the Lord's day today. Yes. I want to pray that God blesses you this week. Let's make an impact. There's a lot of visitors in town. Make sure that when we leave here tonight, we have tracks. Boy, Brother Keith, you got a week ahead of you downtown. Are you, are you going in and out of town, downtown? Listen, let, let's, let's just load up on tracks this week. Uh, you're going to meet people from all over the country and uh, put a big smile on your face and be kind. Put a big smile on your face now. Practice. Very good. And uh, we might could impact somebody, all right? Be careful, too. Be careful. I uh, saw they arrested a man today, one of the uh, riot, one of the rioters, one of the protesters had a machete. I don't know what he's going to protest, but he had a machete with him. So be careful. Uh, but ushers, would you come? want to receive our regular offering. I mentioned uh, August is tight for us. We we're coming at the ends, back to school. A lot of people are spending money. Uh, we understand all that, getting the kids ready for school. Uh, and we are, we are running tight here at the end of the month. So would you pray uh, for our giving, for our offering? Pray, Lord, multiply and use it. Uh, if you haven't seen, the cube is almost fini finished completely uh, with our remodel. The carpet goes in Tuesday, and uh, the final touches, and it's going to be ready for honor here, is save one door. And uh, the reason we did the cube is as long as we're in this property, we keep having to new come up with new ways to use the property, and we have two new Sunday school classes that want to start uh, uh, here on the 16th. One is our faith outreach class. Brother Rick's going to be teaching again how to share our faith with people. And then we have a couple of other classes we'd love to get started, but we just don't have a place to put them. So we've remodeled the cube in order for us to be able to put dividers in to have up to six large classrooms going on a Sunday morning. This will also allow us to start a Spanish Sunday school class, which we cannot do yet because we just don't have the room. And so we've remodeled the cube. It looks great. Brother Courtright has done all the work this summer. And we're going to take an offering for that uh, after Honor Our Heroes so we can try to pay uh, that off. We've, we've done it very, very inexpensively. We've done a great job. It's very, very sharp looking. Uh, but we are spending some money on that. And then we have a $4,000 insurance bill coming up. Uh, we have uh, several other major kind of uh, quarterly things. So it's hitting us a little bit at the wrong time of the year, or it's this time of year, every year really. But uh, if you could be in prayer about our, our offering. And then uh, we're going to come back in just a moment and receive a good offering uh, for the Earnhardts. And again, if you can't give tonight for the Earnhardts, make a note uh, later if you want to give a special offering. We'll make sure they get it. Uh, down the road. Father, bless the offering, the gift, and the giver. We pray and ask it now in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, listen to Brother Tyler and Brother Ed.
right, while the men are coming, I want to see what we're going to do. That moment brought to you by Pentecostalism. Uh, we're going to receive a love offering. That's the word I'm looking for, love offering for the earners. Come on, fellas. While they're coming, let's give you the announcements real quick so we can be dismissed and get home before uh, the storm. S Tuesday morning, everything should be in place for the Senior Saints activity. Uh, ladies' prayer group, the 31st. Honor our heroes when they leave, Brother Steve. Make sure we have plenty of cards for everybody. And then Faith Outreach is kicking back up. Military board out front, if you would help us update that. Uh, tracks and nursery workers, all right? So a lot going on. FBI is right on schedule tomorrow night in case something were to change. Brother Rick will get hold of you. This is the offering for the Earnhardts, and uh, whatever you give will go directly to them. And then if you want to give, uh, maybe this week, drop it by the offering or the office, make an offering note for the Earnhardts, or even Wednesday night. Right, hurry up, get the rest of the offering. All right, God bless you as you give. I was having a stroke there for a moment. Any other announcements at all, Brother Paul, Brother Tyler? Uh, singles activity tonight at uh, Tyler and Julie's house. And uh, we get ready now. We're getting ready to kick back off our, our Bible clubs in the public school as the schools get in session. If you would like to join us for that, uh, see Tyler or Miss Lisa. Uh, but uh, a lot of stuff going on. Stick around. Say hello to the Earnhardts. We love this good family. And uh, back in the back is a fellow named John. I don't want to embarrass you, but I just want to tell, you, tell the folks a story. John is a first-time visitor. He came this morning. He's back tonight. John was listening to the radio this morning. And I heard the broadcast at 7 o'clock, or the broadcast on 860 WGUL uh, and uh, Tampa Bay Gospel Hour. And uh, he said, man, I, I liked it. And he said, I, I came today because he listened to the radio broadcast. And uh, we just, they just, we were just talking about the deacons meeting, if people listen to that. And uh, so that's a neat thing that, John, you came. And I know many of you listen to it uh, while you're getting dressed in the morning getting out. Uh, don't forget, I haven't, I haven't mentioned, but uh, Joyce is home Joyce Abrams is home from the hospital. Keep praying for her. She was hospitalized this week as well. All right, listen, let's have a good week. Love somebody to Christ this week. Let's go after people. Are you Thursday night, Master Club, bus, Friday night. Get your Honor Heroes cards. Uh, the ghost has had a fire this afternoon. I saw on Facebook, uh, nothing bad, bad enough to get the fire department to their house. She said, everything's good. And thank Lord she invited all the firemen to Honor Our Heroes Sunday. So... <laughs> Go home, start a fire, invite the firemen, and have them come to church. Let's stand together. I love you. God bless you. You're dismissed. <laughs>